world's 11th largest economy with a per capita GNI of 30,000 US dollars, Korea. And its high energy capital, Seoul, moves at a pace that rivals the world's busiest with its pulsing creative energy and innovation. Here in Seoul, the economic hub of Northeast Asia, we delve deeper into Korea's economy and what goes on around the world. I'm your host, Panita Bajaj. This week on The Chamber, we discuss tech diplomacy, a new keyword of Industry 4.0, with panelist Kim Young Han, professor at Sungyeonggwan University, and special guest Casper Klunye, the world's first tech ambassador. And for those of you guys who are curious about Korea's economy and what goes on around the world, we are here in Seoul, the economic hub of Northeast Asia. So without further ado, let's step into the chamber. Thank you very much for joining us here on The Chamber, where we talk about the hottest economic trends that have been buzzing around the world. We have Ambassador Casper Clooney, if I'm saying that correctly. Perfect. All righty. And we're here to talk about, well, everything. Um, you know, you being a tech ambassador, and for me, it's a, a bit of a, a new term, and I don't know if I'm the only one here that thinks so, but I guess the first question will have to be, who are you? What are you doing? What does your role entail as a tech ambassador? It, it sounds a bit more special than it might actually be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just to, to come clean and, and put out the disclaimer to begin with, I, I'm in fact a career diplomat and I came straight into this job from being a bilateral ambassador for, for Denmark. It, you know, the role of a tech ambassador is just a response to, to the world in, in 2019 where the technology companies and where technology itself plays an incredibly important role. Mm -hmm. So Denmark decided that instead of putting uh, you know, our head in the bushes, that we try and, and seek to influence the direction the world is taking and trying to have you know, a way of protecting our interests by, by having an ambassador to technology and having an ambassador to the tech industry. Wow, yeah, very interesting. Professor, do you have anything to yeah. add on to that? Yeah, so my question would be, uh, although you provided some kind of uh, answers already, but still there must be a real big driving force for your government have started this kind of new project played by you. So what would the eventual kind of policy goals of Danish government to start this new entrepreneurship business like played by you as a well, tech well, ambassador? You know, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. I think the, the short version of it is to help prepare Denmark for the changes that technology or the fourth industrial revolution is going to bring. And there are opportunities, creating new jobs, economic growth, but of course, there are also risks associated with, with the new, uh, new world order. Mm -hmm. And there are two, two trends that, that is the reasoning behind uh, my government taking this step. Mm -hmm. The first one is that we normally look at international affairs or the balance of power mm -hmm. in terms of conventional weapons or nuclear weapons or economic power. Mm -hmm. What we are arguing is that uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. we need to look at uh, you know, whether you master artificial intelligence or mm -hmm. Internet of Things, IoT. Mm -hmm. Those are also parameters that are influencing uh, the relationship and, and the power, All the right. balance of power between, two, between countries. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is that mm -hmm. you know, the big companies are becoming very big mm -hmm. um, and they have a huge impact on mm -hmm. us individually. We, we spend quite a lot of time on our phones, I'm sure. But in fact, they're also beginning to have an impact over policies, over regulations, I would even argue over our democracies, mm -hmm. uh, our societies. Mm -hmm. and, and we wanted to proactively 
be able to engage on, on those two issues by you know, protecting our interests, by seeking to influence the, the direction the world is, is mm -hmm. heading. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the idea behind the position that, uh, that was created and I was lucky or privileged enough to, uh, to have for a short while. So another buzzword that has been roaming around articles is techplomacy. It's another relatively new word for me. Can you explain to me and perhaps our viewers what that is all about? In technology, uh, as the professor will know better than I do, there is one trend, uh, and that is it's a winner-takes-all market. You know, whoever dominates the market typically becomes very, very large and, and, and very powerful in, in that uh, particular market segment. And I think that concentration of power is, is a huge advantage from a commercial point of view, mm -hmm. but it also brings risks from a societal point of view that we need to be a little less naive about. And I think that's a trend we will see globally as well. Right, so you can easily say that IT is reshaping certainly the global economy. And there are many countries in which its economic value amounts to that of many other countries as well. So could you put that into perspective for us? How, does, how would that work out? Yeah, but if you take a couple of the big companies that I work with on a daily basis, uh, Apple, uh, one of the most valuable companies in the world, if you take the annual turnover in, in Apple, that's more or less the same as Denmark's GDP. So I think that says a little bit about, about the size of, uh, of these big uh, technology companies. But what is interesting is, of course, that the value is enormous. The number of people they employ is relatively small. So I'm sure if you look at a company like Samsung or Hyundai, very valuable companies, but they also employ you know, thousands, if not uh, you know, 100,000, perhaps even millions uh, of people around the world. That is not necessarily the case from, for some of the big technology companies. And the reason I'm saying this is that that brings uh, another important topic, both for a country like Denmark or for a country like, like Korea, and that is the future of the labor market. You know, will we see a reduction of, of the number of jobs because of the new technologies, or will it remain at a status quo, or will you actually be able to increase the, the, the portfolio of jobs? I don't, have a, I don't have an answer to that, but I think what is crystal clear, and I, I, I'm sure the professor um, is, is uh, much more knowledgeable about this than I am, is that massive changes will occur in, in the job market because of new technologies. The jobs we know of today will disappear uh, tomorrow, and, and as a country, as, as a society, we have to begin that adjustment process early on if we're not going to lose out, because this is a a cutthroat, uh, you know, global competitive market that doesn't really respect national borders. And I think that's one of the, the differences between this industrial revolution and, and some of the previous industrial revolutions. Wow, yeah, very interesting. Professor, do you have anything to yeah, add on to yeah, that? Yeah, just as explained by Mr. Ambassador, the real kind of big role and the real big impact played by these big player in IT industry is not just their size. So it's just, it's just as explained the role they play. They set a new rules, they set a new standard. All those new patterns, exchanges, is a real threat for unprepared economies, unprepared kind of uh, circle of societies, unprepared countries. So that's a life of death issues kind of, is, is an imminent issue would be job market issues. So probably as we will discuss soon, kind of what automations widespread automation at various levels, even at the whole, whole city level itself, will make big changes in the job market structure. So those are issues we really have to pay much more effort and attention to get prepared, not just get thrilled with new technological features right. created by right. this kind of new IT industries. They are changing, but in case we are not prepared, those change might be real tragic change. So, so how do you think um, the common uh, citizen could be prepared for these types of changes um, if, the, if it affects their jobs? I think government should play the proper role to help private people to get prepared. And first important issue would be education right. and, and getting them adapted to new technologies. Right. And they cannot be really done by the private sector themselves. That's the typical uh, kind of mission of the government sector, I would say. Well, I mean, speaking of Apple, I mean, has Copenhagen itself benefited from all of these um, companies coming in? Like we've seen Facebook and Apple uh, build, build new centers in the city as well, uh, employing uh, hundreds of people, is that for their benefit or is it something that we need to look out for and say, well, they could pull out at any second as well and leave those hundreds of people jobless? Or 
Um, my job is pr not primarily about attracting investments or, or creating commercial opportunities. It is sort of the politics of technology and that's what we're focusing on. And if we zoom out, uh, not only looking at the countries of Denmark or, or Korea, on a global scale, these new technologies will also have the possibility to connect people, to empower people or to bring long distance uh, healthcare or as the professor said, I, I completely agree with you, education is going to be um, perhaps the most important thing. Um, you know, I think it's very unlikely that my kids will have uh, one job that they will take on, on at, when they turn 25 and have the rest of their lives. I think we will see a lot of changes in, in the workforce and the jobs and that requires lifelong learning. So, so also looking at education as not something you do in the beginning of your life, but actually something that will have to take place uh, throughout your lifespan. All repetitive jobs, I think, will be replaced very swiftly. So traditional uh, you know, industrial production jobs are going to disappear. I'm not sure whether anchors in, in, in yes. news media will, will disappear. I, I, think, I, think, I think you will be around for a little bit longer. Perhaps tech ambassadors will disappear very rapidly as well. Who knows? Who knows? I just hope it will be you know, a little bit uh, later. In right. no, joking aside, I think we just have to, to acknowledge and realize that, uh, that we constantly have to adapt both as small, developed, advanced economies and countries, but we also have to make sure we don't lose big parts of this world uh, as part of sort of a digital divide, because that will right. be the root causes of extremism, of migration flows, etc. So you're just continuing what uh, you, you started back in 2017 for this year's visit as well. Yeah, I think we are, we're a little bit uh, more clever now in the sense that we've We've had this initiative uh, on the ground for one and a half years. We've had many conversations with technology companies and with a lot of other countries. And, and I think we're now ready to take it to the next level, which is to, to create a coalition on responsible technology uh, between countries and a select group of, of companies as well. And I think uh, you know, it's, it's almost a no-brainer that uh, Korea and Denmark needs to work together on this agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Well, while you were here, you definitely met with tech leaders, startup leaders. So let's take a glimpse at uh, one of the events that you've attended. The Danish Embassy's Innovation Center in Seoul hosted a special event this past March. They organized a discussion between the world's first tech ambassador and Korean IT entrepreneurs and technical experts. For them to freely share their opinions on the use of digital technology, new technologies, and startups in today's age of the fourth industrial revolution. Very warm welcome to all of you. The first tech ambassador of the world, Mr. Kasper Klüng. The world's first tech ambassador, Kasper Klunga of Denmark, praised Korea's technical prowess, saying that the country is second to none in the Internet of Things and 5G. We talked a little bit about the future role of technology, both in the, in the positive sense, how do we make sure that we build new companies that we really use artificial intelligence or IOTs and we build smart cities. But we also had a discussion on how do we make sure that we protect the you know, democracies, uh, values, human rights, so that the platforms uh, that were developed in, in our societies, that they don't undermine our societies. And it was really interesting to get a, a Korean perspective on these topics. Korean technical experts attended the discussion as panelists, and they worked with Ambassador Klinger on economic development plans to be pursued through technical cooperation between the two governments. So, what did the two IT powerhouses learn through this two-hour discussion? I think it would be a great idea for the Korea as well, you know, sending some of the, our you know, top diplomats to the Silicon Valley and let them understand the, you know, how the innovation works there and making a kind of you know, some connection between the uh, two areas. The technology is good, but you need to think about the public perception. We had the problem uh, in terms of conflict between cargo couple and taxi drivers. Innovation is good, everybody is known, but the public perception is different. Thing, okay? I hope that the government plays very wise role to find the happy medium or solution between the, 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 among the different stakeholders. 
who knows, uh, we would be uh, very, very happy to see Korea uh, also promoting uh, or appointing a tech ambassador so that we could also work together internationally on, on these topics. Um, so that would be a concrete outcome. And then again, I bring with me a lot of ideas on how uh, I can use uh, this job together with my team and in boosting uh, relations with, uh, with Korea. So it's been a good day. The fourth industrial revolution is ushering in a new era of innovation, productivity and inclusive growth. For sure, tech diplomacy will amplify competitiveness and sustainability for both countries. So as we saw, uh, a number of, of tech leaders, of startup leaders, again, that you had conversations with and met with, you were also talking about the similarities between you know, Copenhagen and Seoul, and one of them, I would think, is about startups. Copenhagen has to be uh, the world's biggest hub for startups when it comes to making new, interesting apps and making the world a better place. And I mean, how is that like to, to kind of see that kind of momentum here in a different country as well? The uh, challenge for all countries, uh, be it in Copenhagen, in Denmark, or, or here in Korea, is to make sure that we build a, a society where innovation and startup and entrepreneurship is, is both cherished and has the possibility to grow. Because again, you know, if we cannot build the, the unicorns of tomorrow in our own countries, we're going to suffer from an economic point of view and probably also in, in terms of, of jobs. I think you know, Denmark is in a pretty good place, but we are still not building the, the unicorns. Uh, that is happening primarily in the US and in Asia. Um, and I think finding ways to, to sort of foster uh, a, a, a local environment that enables uh, you and me to begin a, a small business and, and then see it uh, flourish is going to be incredibly important. I think that's where we can take a lot of inspiration, both from, uh, from Silicon Valley or from Shenzhen in China or, or indeed from Seoul. We, we have an innovation center here in, in, uh, in Korea oh. that are working 24-7 to connect uh, the innova uh, innovation uh, so hubs of, uh, of Denmark and, and Korea. Have you been to the innovation center? Absolutely, they're part of, of, uh, of our organization, so uh, it's, it's something we're very proud of promoting as well. Right, well, is it kind of like Silicon Valley? I mean, people say that it's kind of like a playground. People are dressed in jeans and shorts, and they encourage this type of very silliness uh, type of creativity. Yeah. Is it also the same? in Seoul's Innovation Center. Yeah, I, I think it is. And, and as you can see, I've also gone native in, in the startup environment. I don't wear a tie anymore, mm -hmm. despite being an ambassador. So, <laughs> so I, think, I think having that approach to, to making sure that you, both in your educational system, as the professor mentioned, uh, but also in, in the, the framework, in, in the conditions, the regulatory conditions, that you make sure that people, if they have a good idea, that they can pursue that idea, they can build new companies, they can look at, at all these opportunities that technology will, will bring about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're, we're where we need to be, uh, neither in Denmark nor in, in Europe, and we need a lot of inspiration from, from the outside. Again, it's going to be a global uh, competitive market where we're going to compete uh, without any any uh, respect for, for just traditional borders. So it's, a, it's almost a global approach to, uh, to entrepreneurship that we need to build. Right. So a lot of cities around the world are trying to make their move uh, to have a smarter vision for their city and things like that. I mean, do you have anything? I'll leave it, I'll leave it open for anybody to answer. Is there something unavoidable that trends itself, whether it is uh, kind of pushed by the government policy or not? We will, anyway, eventually going, we will go into that direction. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, uh, yes, it might take some time to get kind of some kind of what uh, fair benefits mm -hmm. from those moves uh, by the whole the citizen itself is another question. So, uh, well, when we think about some real fancy part of the smart city kind of policies, yes, it will reduce the general cost of providing all the city service uh, drastically, and also the efficiency enhancement itself would be also really kind of uh, striking. So we can expect some real kind of fancy futures as a result of integration of the, all those widespread IT clients throughout the whole city services. Mm. But the, who can really benefit from those enhanced kind of efficiency and reduced cost and, and much more benefit? Only, once again, getting back to the same story, only the guys who are prepared and get, who are connected. What about the guys who are not con really connected? And so, once again, I will say, 
uh, for the general citizens really to get benefit in a fair way as a result of smart city policies. Once again, I think there is a really a kind of big role that should be played by the government yeah. to provide more fair kind of uh, chance to get connected. I think the uh, looking at, at the connectivity almost as a utility, I would say almost as a, as a human right that we have to make sure that no one is left behind because that, that will, will, uh, will prevent them from achieving the same benefits as the rest of the population. I think that's going to be an important part. There is a flip side of the coin that we shouldn't lose sight of either, especially for heavily digitalized countries like Korea and, and Denmark, and that is, of course, cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, the more connected devices, the bigger the vulnerability will be for our societies. Mm -hmm. and, and again, if you look at cyber security and cyber attacks, unfortunately, we've probably only seen the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's going to be a massive task for all of our societies. We have malign actors, uh, state actors and non-state actors that are working 24 uh, 7 to attack our critical infrastructure mm -hmm. and with the rollout of IoT the vulnerability will, will increase right. so more focus also on, on, on our security systems on making sure that they cannot right. be hacked or penetrated I think is going to be an area where it, we also need more international collaboration not less international collaboration. Well there must be advantages and disadvantages of being the world's first tech ambassador and you've been going on for two years now. How would you evaluate your tenor, your, your time of uh, being the world's first, Denmark's first as well, a tech ambassador? I, the honest answer is that it's been a fantastic uh, job and a very big privilege for me to, to have had this job for, for the first two years. But I'll also be honest and, and tell you that it's also been uh, a, a job where you get a more a sort of sobering view of what technology is and especially what the big technology companies are doing. Again, I come into this job as a firm believer that technology will, will be a game change in a good way for, for the world and for humanity. But I've also been enormously disappointed in experiencing uh, the lack of interest from some of the big technology players sure. in having conversations uh, with governments like, uh, like the government of Denmark. Um, so the conclusion of this is that I think it's absolutely necessary we bring important big, big issues to the table, the future role of democracy, the future role of our institutions, I would even say whether we can govern both our, our own countries and, and the world. Uh, those are no small issues and, uh, and I think those are important issues. So, so the, the good end answer to, to your question is, do we need tech ambassadors? Uh, you bet, absolutely, and we need more than, than just tech ambassadors from, from Denmark. So I think this role is, is here to stay. Uh, and I think actually it's a role that brings benefit not only to, to countries, but in fact also to the industry. But you know, it, it requires to, to, uh, to play this game and we need to see the companies take a greater interest in, sure. in the responsibility they have. Absolutely. Well, can you share with us regarding your plans as a, as a tech ambassador, what, what is going to go on between the two countries with Korea and, and Denmark? Yeah, I think one of the, the big things uh, we'll be working on, sort of the Rolls Royce, is to perhaps increase our bilateral collaboration on tech diplomacy or on the tech agenda. And, and who knows, something might come up in the next couple of months that might be interesting in, in this area. A good teaser, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the other bit, uh, which is the primary purpose of my visit, is to see whether we can together build this international coalition on responsible technology. That's a multilateral effort, it's not just a bilateral thing, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I, I really hope that it will be uh, possible for, for us to do something together. It, it makes so much sense in, in, in my view. Well, thank you very much once again, Ambassador, for joining us and Professor for sharing your insights. Um, even as an economic professor, how is the show, how is it like talking about uh, perhaps Korea's potential in becoming a smart city and seeing their smart vision? Well, as we discussed before, say we can say Korean IT industry plays uh, some leading role in some area, but uh, our today's discussion with uh, Mr. Ambassador has provided real news insight. The general, just kind of technology itself or just the size of the industry itself is is something, but what we need to care more about would be the proper and right approach to the technology in terms of the policy approach. So in that aspect, I was quite impressed the Danish government approach. So a very kind of what insightful moment it was. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Certainly uh, an educating 
moment right. for right. all of us. Right. Uh, again, we talked about uh, Denmark's tech diplomacy and how Korea could have the potential of following suit shortly. Who knows? Um, and maybe we'll see how there will be plenty of ambassadors around the world that will also follow the footsteps of Ambassador Casper as well. Well, thank you very much for joining us again, and we'll see you guys next week on The Chamber. Thank you. South Korea became the first country in the entire world. The first launch of a commercial 5G service.